Good afternoon and welcome and thank you for joining us uh, this lovely Friday afternoon for the Dean's Distinguished Lecture. Not every day that we have an alumnus as uh, our distinguished lecturer, so I'm very proud to welcome back to Cleveland Dr. Jamie Griffo. Now, if Dr. Griffo had come last weekend, he could have gone on a rock hall tour and maybe rubbed elbows with the red hot chili peppers. <laughs> But uh, we had something equally dramatic this, uh, for, uh, for this visit. Uh, we had a very glamorous IVF tour of Cleveland uh, for Dr. Griffo. Uh, I want to particularly thank some of our tour guides here, Dr. Jim Goldfarb, the IVF pioneer at University Hospital's Ahuja Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Cynthia Austin, the leader in IVF from the Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Bill Merrick, a professor in our Department of Biochemistry who has been orchestrating a great deal of this. I would also say he's had his chance to meet a number of rock stars, including our prospective students in the MSTP program, catalyzed by Dr. Cliff Harding here. Uh, so we, we, did, we did it pretty well. We didn't do as, you know, nearly as good as the, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, maybe better. So uh, Dr. Merrick was uh, Jamie Griffo's thesis advisor, and he told us a few things about Dr. Griffo's formative years here. <laughs> Actually, he was very decorous. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> As a student on the combined MD-PhD track, it usually takes students six or, uh, seven or eight years to complete it. Jamie completed the entire program in six years. During that time, he published not one, not two, but three papers, first author, in the Journal of Biological Chemistry. And one of his papers, entitled RNA-Stimulated ATPase Activity of Eukaryotic Initiation Factors, exploded in citations five years later when a sufficient number of proteins had been sequenced to recognize them as a family, the dead box RNA helicases, and his favorite protein was the best protein, a best characterized protein biochemically. So Dr. Griffo's scientific talent was evident right from the start. In 1984, he went on to residency in OBGYN at Cornell Medical Center and then fellowship in reproductive endocrinology at Yale. Today, he's the director of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and program director of the NYU Fertility Center, which he founded in 1995 with his partners. He's also professor of obstetrics and gynecology at NYU School of Medicine. Among his many career accomplishments, Dr. Griffo is credited with being the first investigator in the nation to successfully screen embryos for genetic diseases or chromosomal abnormalities through embryo biopsy, initiating pre-implantation embryo diagnosis. He is a pioneer in blastocyst transfer, and he's a world leader in egg freezing technology, ICSI, and embryo cryopreservation. His work has culminated in more than 130 medical and scientific articles. Uh, he's just had a remarkable career, and he's had a remarkable career as a physician, helping dozens, hundreds, thousands of families get started as a family. So that's really quite remarkable. Dr. Griffo, your alma mater is proud of you and your achievements, and we're sincerely grateful to have you here as the Dean's Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Griffo. Thank, thank you for your kind words, and you know, I'm a very fortunate guy. I got to train among the rock stars of the real Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I, I got such an amazing education, you know, working in Bill's lab at a time when Richard Hansen came, uh, did my MD-PhD training. It was, it was wonderful. There's so many people I, I probably couldn't possibly recognize all of them. Jim Goldfarb, who delivered my son my last year here. Uh, Ted Perrin, my classmate, who did physical diagnosis with me, and Tom Meddy's uh, class, who Tom taught me so much. I was so sorry to hear of his passing. What a wonderful man. And I'm really grateful to him because he really made a huge impact on my career and how, how it went from the clinical arena and the scientific arena. You know, Tony Towles and Hansons and Merrick's. Really, I'm, I'm just a grateful, lucky man. Um, what I want to talk to you today is about 
how things have changed. Uh, and I wanted to give kind of a historical perspective of you know, what I've learned in the last 30 years of being in the world of assist assisted reproduction. And you know, that was back at a time when in order to have a baby, you know, we all kind of knew that class. It was like a 10 minute lecture in high school. And you know, the world has changed a lot since then. Uh, and I'll end my talk with a slide that really shows you how much. But you know, this kind of scenario isn't that uncommon. You know, maybe 60 is a little pushing it. But I'm a 56-year-old with a four-year-old uh, and a two-year-old. So, um, and you know, the way we get people pregnant has changed a great deal. And a lot of it has to do with assisted reproduction and the development of the technology. And you know, not everybody's happy with everything that we've done, uh, except the people who get to be the parents of these loved, wanted babies. And um, that's also why I'm such a grateful person, because when you help somebody who can't have a baby have a baby, not only do you change their world, you change that child's world, and you change the whole family's world. And anybody who gets the luxury of a job like that is, is a fortunate person. And you know, thanks to the great training I got, um, it's really remarkable. So, I want to start with just some vignettes of you know, what I've learned along the way. And you know, we spend our lives trying to, trying to avoid pregnancy. And the reality is, it's not so easy to get pregnant. And you know, ask any farmer who, you know, how did you get so many plants? Well, they throw lots of seeds out there, because 90% of them are no good. And you know, as a biology watcher, when you look at biologic systems, you know, there's lots of trends that are very highly conserved. Um, and you know, human reproduction is no different. We're probably one of the least efficient reproducers, although some people think differently. But um, and and then you think about how the system was designed, and it doesn't really make sense. But you know, as a scientist, you, you can't really always make sense out of things. But you have to pay attention to the to messages. You know, if you look at men's reproductive health and women's reproductive health, women are born with. Uh, not very many eggs. They lose about 80% of their eggs, 90% of their eggs just being born. They have their most when they're a fetus. Um, and they get to puberty before they've had their first period, and they have 600,000 left. And then you, if you look at an ovary at age 30, 87% of the eggs are gone, and age 40, 97% of their eggs are gone. And reproduction takes a hit. If you look at pregnancy rates age 30 to age 40, it's cut in half. And then every two years after age 40, it's cut in half till after. 44, 45, very few people are able to conceive. And then on top of that, when you're at peak fertility, it takes 13 months for 100% of 25-year-old fertile couples to get pregnant. It's not, it's not very efficient. Um, and then you look at the world of IVF, and, and you look more at the efficiency, and you actually see that nature's kind of conserved something. So you ask the question, all right, I know how many eggs go in my lab. How many babies come out? And if you look you know, at IVF cycles, and you can see that 4.8% of eggs, mature oocytes recovered, that's what that means, live births for mature oocyte recovered, about 4.8% of eggs in all comers of IVF make babies. And you know, if you freeze the egg, that's what the OC column is, that's oocyte cryopreservation, um, you can see a, a similar efficiency. We've now learned how to freeze eggs and, and really conserve their ability to make pregnancies, although we'll talk more about the efficiency of that later. But this slide is just to inform you about how inefficient the system is. And you think about it, it kind of makes sense. 13 months for 100% of 25-year-old fertile couples to get pregnant. You know, some people are wasting 13 embryos to find the one good one. Um, you know, that's, that's nature. And you know, if you look at the best, comer, best comers to IVF, the egg donor population, the young, healthy women donate their eggs, even there, the efficiency you know, per egg retrieval, and you'll see 60% pregnancy rates from just getting one batch of eggs. But on a per egg basis, you're still looking at you know, under 10% of those eggs making babies. And, and that's the system that was designed. I, you can't really make sense of it. You don't need to make sense of it yet. You just have to understand it when you're treating pa patients who are having difficulty. And then, you know, is some of this an artifact of IVF? Are we doing things that make things less efficient? And the answer is, I don't know. But uh, one of my first fellows, actually, I graduated, I started a fellowship for this young man who was actually started as an embryologist in my lab, then ended up going and doing an OBGYN residency, despite the fact that he had done one uh, abroad. Um, and then I started a fellowship for him, because the guy was so smart. Um, 
and he then set up a clinic up the street, as often your best tra trainees do, and he's doing double, double the volume that we're doing. But he's, he took a different approach because he looked at biology a little differently than me, and it's, it's remarkable. So he's done a lot of natural cycle IVF. Forget the drugs, forget the stimulation, forget the anesthesia. You go after the one follicle, you take the egg out, you make an embryo, you put it back, and you don't always get an egg when you do a retrieval in that <coughs> circumstance, and you don't always get an embryo. But when you look at the percentage of his eggs that are making babies without stimulation, it's a big number. It's 21 percent, which, you know, does that mean we're messing up eggs by stimulating the ovary? Um, on the other hand, you say, well, gosh, why doesn't everybody do it this way? Because it takes a lot of cycles and a lot of time and a lot of energy to get that one good egg that makes the embryo. So I don't think this is going to replace what we do. It's a different approach. But there's a lesson to be learned from it, you know, and maybe we need to have better assays you know, as Bill used to always tell me, if you want to answer a question, you've got to have a test that shows that, and you've got to prove your test is a good test. You know, maybe we need better assays to see how stimulation affects eggs, and maybe we can do it better. Um, maybe not. So intelligent design, you know, that's a term that's been coined and talked about. It's really not so intelligent, uh, if you think about it. If you, if you were designing a system to maximize health and reproductive efficiency, you wouldn't have programmed menopause to happen at age 55 in a, in a setting of diminishing fertility and egg number as one ages, especially if you could predict that the species was going to live longer and reproduce later. It would just be, that would be a terrible design. No architect would do that. Now, I don't know who the architect was, he or she or whatever, but it doesn't make any sense, but it's what we're stuck with. Our biology and our sociology are separating. You know, we're living longer. Our stages of our life are changing. We're having babies older, um, and that system just isn't that fair to women. Uh, and women need to be educated, and we in medical school need to make sure women are educated, because that's one thing you missed when I was at Case Western Reserve. No one was talking to us about fertility changing as we got older. We were told, don't worry, ha get your career started, have your kids when you're ready. And we all thought we'd be ready forever, and some of us missed the boat. Um, and it was because we really weren't paying attention. Well, we need to pay more attention, and we need to be smart about how we train our residents, and we need to be uh, in tune with the needs of young women who decide to have careers and still want to have families, and figure out ways to let them do both, because uh, otherwise it's, it's unfair. And you know, the thing about biologic systems, they have their own intelligence. Just because we can't understand it doesn't mean it's not intelligent, but it is what it is. So here's the design. Here's what one cycle of IVF does for a patient as a function of female age. And, you know, under 30, it's over 60%. And you can see the trend. And, you know, around age 38, there's kind of a blip. And around age 41, there's a blip. And after 43, you're pretty much done. Uh, and it's, it, it's cause is the egg. Uh, and it's funny, at the time I started my training in reproductive endocrine, we didn't know a whole heck of a lot, but we did know a few things. And this is another thing that Bill taught me. Take all the data that you have, try and understand what it's telling you, and then see if you can learn from that. So what did I know at the time? I knew that women had a harder time getting pregnant as they got older. I knew that they had more miscarriages. I knew that they made more chromosomally abnormal embryos. So the logical next step scientifically is to think, well, it must be because these eggs are making more chromosomally abnormal embryos. It made perfect sense. So now, I spent the next 25 years of my life in our field, spent the next 25 years developing the assay that we could show that. Um, and at the time I was doing my fellowship training, I started doing fish fluorescent in situ hybridization of embryos as a way to look at chromosomes in a single cell and worked on methods to do embryo biopsy and that resulted in the first human embryo biopsy pregnancy in the United States. We were, we were the second in the world. Well, it spent, I spent four years trying to get the IRB to let me do it, and they wouldn't until the Brits did it first, and then we were allowed to do it. Um, but you know that was 1992, and now we're in 2012. And when I gave my introductory lecture, you know, my first job opportunity after fellowship, I was going around giving this lecture about how there's going to be a day when we screen every embryo, and we make healthy babies. And we find the one that makes the baby, and we, we don't have the one that makes the miscarriage or keeps you from getting pregnant. It was a pipe dream. And believe it or not, I kind of thought through the 90s that it was never going to happen because we just didn't have the tools. 
And it's kind of ironic that over the last three years, things were set in motion, and I'll get to it in the talk, about where we can now do that. Um, so Darwin, you know, I'm a Darwinist. I, I, I think most of us are. Uh, not everybody agrees with it. But, and, and Darwin was right, but not completely. Um, it had a lot of good points. But you know, if you look in our field, you see it. It happens in the lab. You see an egg fertilize. You see the embryo die. You see it not develop. You see it get to day three, look good, and then go to day five, and it's not healthy. Uh, and some of them are healthy. And some of the unhealthy ones make it to day five and look really good. And we put them back and make patients pregnant with what's going to be a miscarriage or what's going to be a baby with a problem. Uh, and we don't know it. And we don't know how to see it. And we'll talk more about that later. But then, if natural selection was so correct, why would half of the euploid embryos that we see on day five, why would only half of them make babies? Is it because we're doing something wrong? Or is that the design of nature? I, I don't really know. But one of the things that I, we did figure out is you know, the, the patient who sits in front of you has had three miscarriages, two miscarriages. And you look at that group of patients and you say, well, you know, it's really a drag. It's really too bad. But you know, if you just keep trying, you're going to get that one good embryo. But you know, it's pretty easy for someone who's never had a miscarriage to get pregnant not thinking about it. But for someone who's had two miscarriages who's told, you know, you got a 30 40% chance it's going to happen again. And you understand the psychological trauma that these patients go through. And you know, this is another lesson that Tom Meddy taught me. Just imagine yourself being that patient. And all of a sudden, you start to think about it differently. And you start to think about, what can I do to make a difference here? Because these people are suffering. This is a death in the family. A miscarriage isn't just you know, a miscarriage. It isn't just a plant that didn't develop. It's a death in the family. And people live with that. They never get over it. They make peace with it. It's awful. And when it happens over and over, and that's your first parlay into building your family, these patients suffer. So how could we help them? Well, we went back to the thesis. Well, let's, let's screen the embryos. And if we find the euploid ones, maybe we give them a better chance. And you know, in the early day of this, we could only check for five chromosomes, seven chromosomes, nine chromosomes, and we were making a difference. But now, over the last few years, we've changed everything. The first embryo biopsy I did, we did at day three. We took one of the cells out of an eight-cell embryo or five-cell embryo or whatever it was. And then we would test that one cell. But we didn't know how to handle the problem of mosaicism. That one cell isn't necessarily what that whole embryo is. And we had to learn that and learn it the hard way. And we were able to make this work and get a lot of people pregnant. But it wasn't perfect. Uh, nothing is and never, never will be. But we realized that if we waited later, we could take what's going to be the placenta. We could take the trophectoderm. And it turns out there's less mosaicism. There's less harm to the embryo. And it wasn't until, one, we knew how to do blastocyst culture well, and that took us a long time. And then two, being able to freeze an embryo and not damage it was another feat that we needed. And three, we needed the assay. We needed that test that would give us the information that we wanted. So you know, we, we could get more DNA than that single cell. We get five, 10, I don't know how many cells, because you can't even count them. But not, a, not very much of the total embryonic volume, whereas at the eight cell stage, you're taking 1 eighth of the embryo. That's a lot. And yet those embryos still make healthy babies. Doesn't make sense, but they do. <clears throat> and there's less mosaicism. There's a lower error rate. And we're doing pretty well with this right now. I'm never going to say it's zero, but we're, I haven't found my error yet. And we've been doing this method for now uh, two years. And it's really working. Um, it doesn't hurt the embryo as much. And you have fewer embryos to process, because it's a lot of work to do this. Um, and you know, the ones that declare themselves as abnormal, we don't have to waste our time with. They're abnormal. We're not going to do anything with them. Um, and then. You got them in the freezer. You don't have to take them out four at a time, or three at a time, or two at a time. You can take them out one at a time and not make so many triplets. Uh, and then put them back in a cycle that's more controlled, where the patient isn't undergoing ovarian hyperstimulation. And we don't know the impact on the endometrium. We could do it in a more natural environment. Um, and is that better? And I don't have the answer. But, but now you need the assay. And the assay is uh, ACGH, or Array Comparative Genome Hybridization. So here's how it works. You take a chromosome. You take all chromosomes. You get a bunch of spots across the chromosome. And you have markers for them. And then you take 4,600 different spots across the genome, and you stick them on a glass slide so that now you can hybridize your normal DNA, which you label in red. It's a known normal control. And then you take your test DNA from your embryo, and then you co-hybridize. And then you do a color metric analysis, because you got red for your normal and green for your embryo. And 
you know, you look at the colors and, you know, when you have too much green, it says there's more copies of, of your embryo DNA and you got a trisomy. And if you got too, you know, you got too much red, it says you got not enough from your embryo and now you got your monosomy. And then you got your normal where you got the right impact from both the normal and the, and the, and the test sample. So here's how it looks when you run it out and you see all the spots. And you know, you can look at this and see that you got two copies of everything, although you can't really know there's two copies because it doesn't distinguish polyploidy. If you had three copies of everything, you'd get this graph. But you know, polyploidy fortunately is not a big problem. It is a problem, but a very small problem. But this one you can see that's 46XY. And you know, in an, in an afternoon, you can take a few cells from an embryo and know about the chromosomes of the embryo. And then you find out lots of embryos that look good aren't. And you know, here's an example of you look at chromosome 10 and there's a relative lack of it in the test sample and there's an extra dose of the chromosome 16 and you can say that this uh, is missing 10 and has 16 and even though it has the number correct 46 number of chromosomes that embryo is not going to make someone pregnant and fortunately most of these embryos don't make you pregnant but we were putting them back in the old days of IVF because we didn't know we looked at the embryo it looked healthy we, we gave it a chance but we didn't know the cycle failed, the patient would say, well, what'd you do wrong, doc? You know, what's the matter? Can't you get me pregnant? And we didn't know. We didn't have the answer. And patients want answers. Well, so we took this group of recurrent miscarriage patients and did the experiment. We think it's aneuploidy. So let's get rid of these aneuploid embryos. Maybe we can help you. So at first we were doing day three biopsy before we had enough data to know that day five biopsy was better. And here's one of the things. We saw Darwin in the lab. If you look at the number of percent of euploid embryos from a day three biopsy, only a third of those good looking embryos that you biopsied were chromosomally normal. That means 70% of them were chromosomally abnormal. And that's what we used to put back when we transferred embryos on day three. That's why we used to put back three and four embryos and make all those triplets because sometimes they were all good and sometimes they weren't. Um, and in order to get a good pregnancy rate, you had to kind of rig the deck in favor of too many embryos. Not, not good. Um, on day five, you had fewer embryos to biopsy because Darwin in the lab. Nature screened out a lot of those embryos, um, and yet even half of those embryos were still chromosomally abnormal despite the way they looked. Um, so now with this array CGH where we could look at all 24 chromosomes, we found the assay that Bill was telling me I need to find. And you know, here's our own internal data. The data I showed you was a multi-centered trial that I presented at ASRM. Several centers treated recurrent miscarriage patients. And we showed that we could you know, use this technique to really help these patients. But again, this confirms day three embryos, 25% normal. For day five embryos, 40% normal. Still, a lot of abnormal embryos, and just embryo culture alone was a screen. <laughs> <clears throat> but array CGH was a much better screen. Um, and then we started seeing that if we biopsied the embryo on day three versus day five, we were having much better pregnancy rates with the day five biopsy. Why? You're taking less of the embryo. We learned how to freeze and not, and not harm the embryo. And it became pretty clear that day three embryo biopsy, which from 1992 until about two years ago, was the way we used to do it. And now it's, now it's historical. Um, and it, it, it's a good thing. But now you take these recurrent miscarriage patients and you look at the young versus the old, older. Uh, I don't want to say old because 35 is young, um, uh, especially when you're my age, 56. You know, 35 is really young. Um, but you know, in a group of patients based on age with two or more miscarriages, you would expect 26% of patients under age 35 to miscarry. And now you screen out their aneuploid embryos, and all of a sudden 9% of those patients ha have miscarriage instead of the 26%. It says the thesis is almost right, uh, or pretty close. But you look at over 35, you see more of an impact. We expect a 38% miscarriage rate in this group of patients based on history. And now you're putting back these euploid embryos, and you only get a 7% miscarriage rate. And then you find out, because I do this to all the patients, they miscarry, I do a chromosome testing of the miscarriage. And what do you find? They're all euploid, the ones they're miscarrying. We're not misdiagnosing them. There's more to miscarriage than, than aneuploidy. The most of it is aneuploidy, but now all of a sudden, what used to be idiopathic, idiopathic, you love that term? I tell it to my patients all the time. Well, you, you have idiopathic recurrent miscarriage. 
makes him feel really good. Okay, doc, I came to the right guy, he's really got it. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Idiopathic, that means I'm an idiot and I don't know your pathology. Uh, and they kind of look and they go, oh, well that's not good. And I said, don't worry, we don't have to understand everything. We do know how to treat this. Well, it actually turns out idiopathic recurrent miscarriage isn't really idiopathic at all. It's recurrent aneuploidy for the vast majority of patients. So now, you know, that's half of the patients with recurrent miscarriage. The other half, we have definable causes. Well, now probably only about 7% of patients truly have idiopathic miscarriage. We still need to learn about that group. But this technology has, has taught us something, and now our next generation of medical students won't be using that term idiopathic recurrent miscarriage so much, which is good. Uh, we don't like being called idiots. Um, so, and then the, the other thing is, if you look at day five embryos, that were screened this way versus day three. We even had a lower miscarriage rate, even though the, most of the miscarriages were euploid. Um, it seemed like there was less harm to the embryo that made it cause the miscarriage. So, so it's really now day five is the way to go. We have fewer miscarriages from day five. We have better diagnostics. We have more material. We have better results. So more of the embryos make babies. So I, I think day three biopsy, as I said, is now history. So we've been doing this technique for a while, and, and um, you know, I can just report, and the certain patients that we've used it on, recurrent miscarriage patients, we don't use it on everybody, although I think the time will come, that that dream I had when I was this ideal, you know, idealist as a, you know, fellow, like this was gonna, this is the way it was gonna be, and then I led the 10 years where I didn't think my dream was gonna come true, because we didn't have the tools. But now we got the tools, and it really looks like we'll be able to screen most patients if they choose, put back one embryo, and get fewer miscarriages, better pregnancy rates, and we'll keep the NICUs empty. Sorry, uh, you know, but that's a good thing. Um, but you know, in 89 patients, we did 105 thaw cycles, you know, from their retrieval, and we got because we got embryos in most of the patients. Some embryo, some patients had more than one and had more than one transfer, and we thawed 152 embryos to be able to transfer 149. Some patients wanted two. Some patients I could talk into one, and I'll talk about that group on the next slide. But we were seeing pretty high pregnancy rates, and a group of patients who failed IVF multiple times elsewhere or had recurrent miscarriage, not your best ca caliber patient who has like the chip shot diagnosis that you're gonna get them pregnant with their first IVF attempt. These are patients who didn't have as good a prognosis, but all of a sudden, now you start putting back euploid embryos in these patients, and you're getting really good pregnancy rates in a group that, you know, if you just did blind IVF, transfer what you thought was the best embryo, you weren't gonna get these pregnancy rates. And then if you looked at, from one retrieval, what percent of the patients get pregnant, you get 72% of these patients got pregnant, and we haven't, we haven't transferred all the embryos. It's gonna take us a while to get through all these embryos that are still in the freezer. And some of these patients won't, because some of them have uterine problems and they can't really carry. They have Asherman syndrome, they've had, you know, bad myomectomies and their lining is no good and they're going to have to put those embryos in a gestational carrier because their uterus is the problem and you can put euploid embryos in a bad uterus, you're not going to get pregnancies. Um, but you know, that's pretty respectable data. But you know, my dream of being able to do a single embryo transfer and still have a high pregnancy rate, have a low multiple rate and a low miscarriage rate because it's really not fun getting somebody pregnant and they're spending $10,000 or their insurance company paying for it, and then they get to the fetal heart stage and then they lose their pregnancy. It's not a very satisfying outcome for anybody. It's, it's an awful outcome. It's even worse than a negative pregnancy test in many respects. And so for the patients who we did this analysis on, where we did the Ray CGH on their blastocyst, froze them, and I could talk them into a single embryo transfer, we did that in 64 patients, or 64 thaws. We thawed 65 embryos to get those 64 embryos to transfer. That's really high survival rate. In the old days of freezing, 70% survival rate was good. 50% was respectable. Well, we're much better now. Vitrification and blastocyst, and then if you freeze a euploid embryo, it's gonna survive better than if you're freezing an aneuploid embryo. Uh, there is kind of a Darwin in the lab effect. The, you know, the frozen thawed aneuploid embryo isn't going to survive as well, but now we're only doing it on the euploid embryos. So we're going to get a 98.5% survival rate. And so from those 64 embryos put back, there were 37 sacs on ultrasound. Two of the sacs didn't develop, and one that had a fetal heart, so there were, thir there were um, 
35 that had fetal heart and one with a fetal heart didn't, so there were three miscarriages in that group, which is an 8% miscarriage rate, which in a group of patients with this mean age, you would expect a regular IVF about a 15 to 25%, depending on the program you look at, miscarriage rate, so now they have less losses. They had one, there was one twin, one monozygotic twin, an embryo split, so a, a 2.7% twin rate. You, you just don't see that high a pregnancy rate with that low a multiple rate from the way we've done IVF before. So I really think that this is gonna be the future. And that dream that I have that I kind of lost sight of, now that we have the tools and the assay, and that's a Ray CGH is an assay. Um, and you know, the next assay, the next generation of this assay, we're gonna be on version, I don't even know the number, is gonna be sequencing. We're gonna be doing sequence. And you know, we can do single gene disorders and aneuploidy assessment. And who knows, we're gonna start seeing, you know, small deletions and other things that are associated with problems and out outcomes. You know, it just, who knows where the, you scientists are gonna take us so that we can do this even better and give us the better tools. Um, so then another lesson is, it's not always the husband's fault, except when it is. Um, you know, m most infertility is not male factor. Um, a percentage is, it's about 35%. Um, but, you know, nature, and I don't know why she designed it this way, you know, men can reproduce the day they die. It's not true for women. And why would you design a system like that? I, I don't know. And again, like I said, intelligent design isn't so intelligent. It doesn't make sense. But it is what it is. Those are the facts, and we have to kind of explain them and understand them or just accept them. But um, men keep making new sperm every 90 days. You have new sperm, so you, you, don't, you don't get as much aneuploidy because those sperm don't sit in meiosis one for 30, 40 years before they're then ovulated, fertilized, and, and meiosis is completed. And when that happens in a 25-year-old egg, you get a very different outcome than what happens in a 45-year-old egg. Um, and the other thing is male age has very little impact on fertility, but the reality is there is an impact, and we see slightly higher autism rate and maybe a slightly higher miscarriage rate when the males are older. But you know there are times when it is the husband's fault. There are male factor patients that have a very low sperm count. Um, sperm does determine the gender. It's the one little thing we have left. I mean, we're missing half a chromosome. Face it, we're the, we're the inferior sex. Just get over it, guys. We're done. Um, and now we're actually not even necessary. You know, <laughs> that's the unfortunate side effect of this technology. We, we're history. But, um, you know, we have some good points. Um, but we are missing that, that half a chromosome. But, you know, we've kind of not paid much, as much attention to sperm, and maybe we should because maybe it isn't just the egg and the aneuploidy. Maybe we are being a little misled. And people have started to look at oxidative damage in in the sperm, and look, I'm an open-minded scientist. I, I said, you know what, we better start paying attention. So, you know, some French study came out and looked at sperm DNA fragmentation, and a lot of us haven't been that interested in it because we don't really know what to do about it. But, you know, you start paying attention, and you start looking and collecting data, and you start seeing that there's a lot of DNA fragmentation in, in sperm. It doesn't matter the guy's age. And as a, as a group, those patients don't do so well. So we go back to the lab and we develop an assay, 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine uh, as a measure of oxidative damage to sperm. So we play with this assay and think of a great experiment. Well, look, we, we take the sperm that's left over from the IVF and let's do a test on it. We'll know the outcome. Let's see if something correlates. So we do this assay and, um, well, we'll skip that slide. We don't need to see it anyway. Um, and we look at a lot of oxidative damage, a little ox oxidative damage. So when there was a lot of oxidative damage and you looked at either beta HCG, which is pregnancy rate, or you looked at fetal heart from the result of that cycle, when there was a lot of oxidative damage of the sperm, there was a linear correlation with outcome. A lot of damage, lower, lower baby rate, lower pregnancy rate. And now the next step is, one, can we make this assay reproducible? Can we make it clinically useful? We've got a lot of work to do on that. But, um, and then, can we treat this? You know, is this a nutritional thing? Is there more to it? Is it just the smoking and drinking? Is it the tidy whities and the boxers? Is it, you know, the bicycling? Is it, you know, who knows? We've got to figure it out. Um, but, you know, that'll have an impact on our outcome. And maybe some of those euploid embryos that aren't making babies 
are because there's something in the sperm that, that don't let them make babies. That, uh, but you know, that's the beauty of what we do is every day we can ask a new question, don't always get the answer. <clears throat> well, we always observe, so we always look. We always, I mean, think about the first days of fertility, what did we do? We looked at sperm and we developed, you know, you look at the count, you look at the motility, you look at morphology, the shape of the sperm, and we developed this method of looking at sperm and you know, this thing called morphology. And it's funny, I don't think I ever see anybody on a semen analysis with normal morphology. We say, well, I'm treating only infertility patients, but you take a normal guy, and most of them don't have normal morphology. I don't know where we get the normal values from, because I think our assay needs to be recalibrated. But then, you know, as, as a clinician scientist treating patients, and you see the guy who sits down next to the wife, and the wife is pissed, he's got bad morphology, his count's normal, his motility's normal, She's healthy, everything's fine, and they're not getting pregnant. And they've been told by the urologist, well, you need to have surgery, you got a varicocele, and you need to stop smoking and drinking and all this stuff. And you look at them and you say, well, I'm not so sure this morphology means anything. And they look at you and say, well, that's not what the doctor up the street said. They said, I need IVF, you need to do ICSI, you need to inject that single sperm into the egg, because that's the only way we're going to have a baby, otherwise I'm never going to have a baby. And I say, well, that might be true, but maybe it won't be true. Let's just try some IUI. And guess what? A lot of them got pregnant. And guess what? You look at IVF, whether they do ICSI or don't do ICSI. Morphology didn't predict it. And you know, this is the kind of thing where the peer review process isn't so much peer review as peer suppression sometimes. It took us a long time to get this paper published. No one wanted to believe it. No one wanted to let that die. No one wanted to not be able to use that as a reason to do ICSI. And you know, the next paper that we put out was, hey, we're overutilizing ICSI. Not many people wanted that published either. Um, but it is what it is. Um, it's not really helpful, and I think we should get rid of it, out of the semen analysis, but that's not going to change anytime soon. But at least we can comfort patients and take the guy off the hook in those circumstances, just say, hey, forget about your morphology, eat healthy, live healthy, you want to fix your varicocele, go ahead, but let's get you pregnant, and we'll, we'll do some things and be a good chance of success. Well, it's no different with embryos. I mean, we used to look at embryos, and we thought that that was the way we could pick the embryo. So let's look at morphology. So we look at morphology, but now we got an assay. Now we got a Ray CGH as an assay. So we look at top quality morphology of an embryo, and it doesn't predict aneuploidy or euploidy. And in fact, about 60, about 30 to 40 percent of the best quality embryos, and that, that one bar there, uh, let's see if my pointer works, I mean with only two samples is an outlier, so just throw that out of the picture. I, I can't for scientific reasons because people think I'm fudging data, but it's not, it doesn't mean anything. You know, about 30, 40 percent of those embryos that look good aren't. They're, they're, they're aneuploid. So looking at an embryo isn't the solution. Uh, what you see isn't always what you get. And, you know, for years we were transferring embryos on day three, and these are day three embryos. So anybody in the audience want to tell me which ones are euploid and which ones are aneuploid? The embryologist in the audience will say, you know what, there's not an embryo up there I wouldn't transfer. Some look a little better than others, but I would transfer it. And on day three we would, but now, I've learned, let's not transfer them on day three, let's wait, let's wait to day five. So there's what they look like on day five. And you ask your, my embryologist, which one wouldn't you transfer? Which one would you pick? And guess what, you get seven people and you blind them, they don't all pick the same one. And these are good people. These, these are people who've done 25,000 IVF cycles in their career. They're as, as good as anybody in the world. Well, it's not because there's a problem with them, it's because the assay is no good. Looking at an embryo <coughs> doesn't tell you. And so now there's this whole technology developing called time lapse. You know, we'll learn more by watching the embryo in time. And you know, it's an interesting technology, and, and maybe it will give us some answers. But I'm a scientist. I'm not just going to accept because people are saying that's what works, and no one's really proven it. But now there's 150 programs with a time lapse. You guys have one, we have one, everyone thinks this is going to be the next greatest thing. I think what it is is a really great incubator, because you don't open the doors. You keep it closed, and you're not bothering these embryos, and you're letting the time-lapse picture taker show you what the embryos are doing, and you're not opening the, the, the doors to look at them. And so I had a patient who had twins. Her embryos were frozen in 2001. She called me up. She said, look, I got those 10 embryos that are just sitting there. I don't want you to give them to anybody, because..." I don't want my kids to have genetic siblings out there. Can you do something useful with them? Can you not just throw them away, because I don't want them anymore? Can you do an experiment that may, may help us? 
or help somebody? Because I know what I went through. I want to help the next patient. So I said, sure, here's my idea. What do you think? Sounds good. So we put these 10 2PN embryos in the, in the laser scope, and we let them go to blastocyst. And then we biopsied the trophectoderm. We biopsied the inner cell mass. I, it's so recent. I don't have the data for the inner cell mass because we want to look at mosaicism. But then, you know, in time, we could do the time lapse, and you know, here it is. Here you'll see these embryos, and you'll tell me which one is euploid and which one is aneuploid. You know, I had my embryologists look at the embryos. I had them tell me which ones they thought were the best. It turns out, just on morphology alone, there wasn't, of the 10 embryos, only nine made it to blast. So there was one clear embryo that nobody would transfer. But of the nine remaining ones, based on day three or day five morphology, we would put them all back. And based on time lapse, the time lapse experts, there were three of them, I had them look at it blinded, and I said, tell me what you think. So they, based on the parameters that are in the literature, they chose three embryos that they said, these are, have a high likelihood of being euploid. Well, one of the three was euploid. And that means they missed, because five, five of these nine embryos were euploid, they missed four using that. And so, I, you know, this is one experiment. It's a small series. But guess what? We got the assay now. So here's the results. I mean, the ones on top are all aneuploid. They look pretty good. The ones on the bottom, they look good too. They're normal. Um, and only half of them will make a baby. And it may be that time lapse will help us figure out which of the euploid ones are the ones that are going to make a baby. But now here's what we're going to do. Now we got this $100,000 instrument in our lab. We got the assay. Well, we'll just put the PGD patient's embryos in the laser scope. We'll catalog the time lapse. We'll know aneuploidy. We'll know which embryos make babies. And we'll be able to go back in time and look at the time lapse. And then we'll really maybe get some meaningful data. And maybe we will find the thing that we found. Because right now, when we went back retrospectively, I let the time lapse people go back retrospectively. Here's the normal ones. Here's the abnormal ones. Tell me if you can find something. They actually found that early compaction was more likely to be a, an aneuploid embryo. And it may be that maybe there is some parameter that we can use to help us then better select, even better than the PGD. But um, you know, it's a great job. You learn something every day. You always got a new project. You know, and here it is, the blastocyst. Look at them. You know, I, I, I got to tell you, though, I would have picked this embryo here as the best embryo. And it turned out to be a euploid one. But again, there's not one embryo in that picture I wouldn't transfer. And I, there isn't one embryo in that, this picture that looks like any of these embryos that hasn't made a baby. But um, you know, morphology is overrated. And with sperm, it's really overrated. <clears throat> so now, frozen. Frozen is the new fresh uh, when it comes to eggs. So why would you freeze an egg? Well, the first egg was frozen in 1986. And we weren't very good at it, because we weren't very good at IVF then. And we were doing day three transfers, and we had lousy success rates, and we didn't really know how to freeze. And through the 90s, um, we got better. And, and you know, it turns out there are times when non-practicing physicians practice medicine. So um, the Italian government decided they would practice medicine. They passed the law. They said people like me treating patients could only fertilize three eggs and put back everything. You can't freeze anything. That's the law. That's what we're doing. That's how we're practicing medicine here in, in Italy. And they didn't realize what they did was they compromised the care for that whole generation of patients, Italian patients. They got suboptimal care. And it was clear, if you knew the science and the data, that they were doing a wrong thing, a bad thing. But that was the law, and you had to follow the law. So you know, these things have unintended consequences. And the good consequence, because there was a lot of bad consequence, but the good consequence was people like me in Italy had all these eggs, and they didn't know what to do with them. They started freezing them. They started making the methods better. And pretty soon, they started getting babies from frozen eggs. And that's around, you know, 98, 2000. And we started paying attention. And we started realizing we were better at freezing eggs. And we were better um, at a lot of things, including going to blastocyst and freezing and thawing embryos. So you know, what do you do? You go to the lab, and you ask questions. So we go to the mouse lab, and Wei Louis, and myself, and Lou Cray, in a mouse system, started freezing and thawing mouse eggs. And we started developing the NYU vitrification method, which is a little different than Kuyama's method. Um, and we tested the slow freeze method of uh, Porku, because she thankfully gave it to us. 
uh, and we started making mouse babies. And you know, we, did, we don't do these things thoughtlessly. You know, if we're gonna do this on a patient, let's make sure it's good. So let's, let's look at the spindle. Does it, is there a problem? Let's count the chromosomes. Are they all there? You know, after you freeze and thaw these eggs. So you do some basic science things to convince yourself that you're not doing harm because that's what we do, first do no harm. Um, and then you start making mouse babies. And you know, it looks like vitrification is better than slow freeze in the mouse system, but you know, there'd been enough success in the human system that we decided we would do a clinical trial. And we did this for all new technology, whether it was embryo biopsy, ICSI, blastocyst. We take a bunch of patients, we say, look, we're gonna do this for free because we don't have any experience. We don't have any results. So we took a group of patients who are gonna do IVF and we said to them, look, we think we're good at egg freezing. How about if we give you a free cycle, we'll freeze all your eggs, we'll wait a few months, we'll thaw them all, we'll make embryos, we'll put back the best couple of embryos. We know we're gonna get a lot of you pregnant, we don't know what the success rate's gonna be, but what do you, you, know, what do you lose? You, you get a free cycle, you said you couldn't afford it, you, know, you get a chance, and patients sign up. We did 23 cycles, and we had a 57% delivery rate. In a group of patients, mean age, 33, range 27 to 37, and, um, you know, here was our first baby born from egg freezing, 2004. Uh, pictures a few years ago. She was delivered in 2005, um, and it resulted in this paper, which, again, peer review, peer suppression. I submitted this article to one, two, three, five journals, and finally, I resubmitted it a second time to Fertility Surreal because I couldn't believe it wouldn't get published. For the first time, we had shown that we could get the same pregnancy rate from a cycle of frozen thawed eggs as a fresh IVF cycle. And we subsequently published a paper that said, we get, if we did a cycle where we froze all embryos, we get the same pregnancy rate whether we do fresh IVF, whether we do frozen eggs, whether we do frozen embryos, we get the same pregnancy rate. Um, now, it's not the same efficiency. Um, if you look per egg, you're gonna see a difference. And you know, if you look at different ages, you're gonna see a difference. And, and certainly, you know, with egg donor, the best group, you know, we see numbers that are very similar to what we see with fresh IVF, even with egg efficiency, but with IVF patients and older patients, not so much. Uh, that the extra embryos that you don't get, freezing and thawing an egg and making embryos and going to blast, uh, you, you lose some efficiency you make healthy babies, but it's not as efficient on a per egg basis, but on a per cycle basis. And, and you know, if you look, you know, at all of the cycles that we did uh, at the time, you know, you look at the efficiency of oocyte cryopreservation, OC, versus the IVF cycles, it wasn't so good, you know, on a per egg basis, even though we showed per, per cycle it was the same, uh, because there is some damage that happens with freezing and thawing an egg, and it does have an impact on the result. <clears throat> and then there's also the extra embryos. If you add those in, even with egg donor, you're gonna see a difference. You got more embryos that are in the freezer. If you calculate what percent of those are gonna make babies, even when you do it on the best case scenario, uh, egg freezing isn't as efficient as fresh IVF, but it's still very efficient, and it's still an option and an opportunity. And it's an opportunity for cancer patients. It's an opportunity for, you know, in New York, you see what I see, you know, you have these women who are on a career track and they know it and they're making a choice and they know it and they're anxious about it and they don't wanna have egg donor as their, as their final treatment for their infertility because they decided to do career over having a family. So they're coming in droves to freeze their eggs and be their own egg donor when they're ready, if they need them. And, and so they have an insurance policy. It's not a great one. You know, if you do it, under th age, do it age 33 and under, you're going to get about a 50% shot at it from one cycle. And if you batch a couple of cycles, you're going to get a better number. But it's not going to be 100%, never. Um, but it is an option, and it's controversial. There's people who think we shouldn't do it. The ASRM still calls it an experiment. Um, I'm not really sure why. Um, but it is what it is. So it's now an option and it's out there. And we've done about 900 cycles of egg freezing, you know, about 120 of them are for cancer and the rest of them are elective egg freezing for women who are delaying childbearing. Um, so now we come to the part of the talk. And again, you know, I just want to mention Tom Meddy, who was so important in my clinical training. And, 
you know, he made me a better doctor. He taught me no judgment. He taught me empathy. That's the first thing you think about. You sit in front of a patient, you need to try and understand what they need. Try and understand what it's like to be them. Try and understand how they feel. And forget about how you feel, because you don't matter. You're the doctor, you're the servant. You're not the, you're, you're not the reason the patient is here. The patient is the reason you're here. And he, drain, he drummed that into us. And now Ted Parent, I think, is in the audience. Uh, you know, he's the next generation of, of Tom and is doing the same thing. But, you know, we do some crazy things in our field. And not everybody's happy with what we do. But, you know, when you sit in front of a single woman who says, you know what, I, want, I still want to have a baby and I don't have a partner, instead of judging, you just say, well, how can I help you? And you know what? Those, those women have amazing kids. Why? Because they're wanted babies. And that's the secret sauce. And anybody who has to go through assisted reproduction to have a baby is a special parent because all of a sudden you are told what a gift it is to be a parent. It's not a God-given right. It's a gift. And when you have to experience infertility, you get it. And your kid, your child, it gets, is, the, is the recipient of that good thing. Um, and it's a great thing. And so, you know, people are building families in all different ways. And, you know, back when I was doing my MD, PhD, there was one way to have a baby, maybe two. You could use donor sperm. Um, IVF was just starting, so maybe there were a few more. But if you look at all the different ways you can make a baby now, depends on where the egg comes from, where the sperm comes from, who's carrying the pregnancy, and you look at all the configurations of family, you got a couple, that's kind of standard, but then you got a single woman, a single man, you got a lesbian couple, you got a gay couple. You got 37 different ways to make a baby, and I didn't even throw in the possibility of nuclear transfer. I don't go there, it's too complicated. Uh, and I got into too much trouble with that. That's another story, that's another lecture. Um, but so, yeah, we have changed the world, and you know, maybe it isn't all good, and maybe not everybody's comfortable with everything we've done. But I would argue wanted babies are the secret sauce to the, our future and to our success. And it doesn't matter the configuration of where they grow up in, is if they're wanted and they're, they're taught to be citizens and they're taught to go out and live their lives with passion and do something and make a difference like I got trained here at Case Western Reserve. What did I get in my training? I got the opportunity to use a skill set that was given to me by many of you in the audience and go out and make a wider difference than just that one patient in front of me. We got to change how we do our field and make it better, and I got to be a participant of many fantastic people in our field who have changed it, and you know, my MD, PhD training was the tool, and you know, I am so grateful for many of you in the audience uh, who got me there, and I, I appreciate that. So, you know, how do we acknowledge? I mean, the TNTC, too numerous to count, because I can now spend the next hour thanking people. Uh, it, it's just too, too hard to do. But uh, again, just in the audience, Bill Merrick, who trained me, uh, who was my research mentor, Richard Hansen, who came when I came. Actually, I came when he came, excuse me, I said that wrong. <laughs> uh, and, but the energy he brought to this medical center was just outstanding. Jim Goldfarb, who delivered my son uh, my last year here, uh, and we've been good friends along the way, and you know we've helped each other in many ways. Uh, you know, Ted Parent, a good friend. We used to go to the Browns games together and watch them lose weekly. It was fun. Uh, you know, you needed to blow off some steam, sit there and scream at the refs. It was fun. Um, and watch the Steelers winning yet again. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and Tom Meddy, who I'm so sorry to hear the news. He's such a wonderful man. Um, but he lives on, uh, and he lives on in the next generation of, of us. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to talk, and I appreciate the opportunity. <coughs> for a couple of questions. Question? Um, so I had a couple of questions about a couple of pieces of data you showed, and maybe I missed them on the graph. First was the oxidative damage. Um, the oxidative damage to the sperm, and you had talked about age, but it looked like to me maybe the 25-year-olds, the younger people appeared to have 
was was I misreading the graph? But they appeared to have more oxidative damage than um, the older individuals. No, actually, the, the age was on that opposite? slide was more the female age, because you know, as you know, female age makes a difference in the outcome. And let me pull the slide up. Um, let's go back. Sorry, it's going to take a second. No, that's fine. I can quickly tell you. The second question was I was wondering. Uh, you said that there was a you were picking up more mosaicism in the day three. Um, samples than when you sampled the trophoectoderm in the day five samples. And I was wondering if you thought that that was more an effect of the, the Darwinian effect in the lab and you were less likely to find a mosaic sample, or was it something developmental that... Well, I think it's developmental. I think the embryo can correct itself. Because it was shown, you know, day three embryos that are biopsy diagnosed as abnormal, if you let them go to blast and then retest them, a lot of them become normal. So that, you know, Darwin in the lab does happen. It kicks out the bad... bad cells, but you know what? Probably in this audience, probably everywhere, there's a group of mosaics out there, and I'm probably mosaic and don't know it, um, because you didn't test every single cell in my body and every single cell type. Maybe I have a, a mosaic cell line, and it doesn't have an impact in overall development, and you know, there's a certain tolerance uh, in individuals, but it's very clear that there is more mosaicism at day three than day, day five, although the data set, day five mosaicism, is limited because we haven't tested that many embryos, and it's a low it's a low number, much lower than what we've seen in day three embryos. Now here's the data for the. Um, um, it doesn't really have the age. The age actually was on the previous slide. It was more female age. Oh, I was it, referring to the other it, chart. I think it was right before this, right with the. Um, it was a table. Yeah. So the oh, was it the number of patients? So I had seen percent of fragmentation. Oh, I had been thinking it was 20 to 30-year-olds no, had. It's not looked at age. It's just, you know, what percent of patients had less than 20% fragmentation? It was 40%. What percent of patients had, you know, 20 to 30% fragmentation? It was 28%. The, this, the, the mean age, it was a wide range. I, I, don't, I should know it, but I don't. No, no, uh, I had thought yeah. that had said age. It, it was somewhere in, in the 30s because, you know, they don't do IVF in older patients there. And, and ours, I, didn't, I don't have the age here. Mainly, I had the female age because that matters more. And it is true that low sperm damage, oxidative damage, the patients were a little bit younger, and therefore, and generally, their partners are about the same age. So it does. There is a little bit of an age effect, but you know, this, the data set is too small to really make definitive statements. And then the data set is really too preliminary because we really need to validate this assay. We're not there yet. We need to get bigger data, bigger data pool to see if this is really true. I mean, it looks pretty convincing when you got these kind of graphs, but you know, we haven't published this yet because uh, it's not publishable in my eyes until we have more data, more reproducibility, and, and a bigger population. Learned that validation here, right, Bill? Yep, yep, Bill okay. taught me that one. Very good, oh, thank you we, very we, much. Uh, and I appreciate uh, uh, your attendance, I appreciate uh, Dr. Griffo. We have a small gift for you. Uh, it's uh, a silver frame, and we've taken a few pictures here. And when we get a good one, we'll send that to you. We will send you the whole packet. and. Uh, in the mail, and we hope you'll think of uh, your time here at Case Western Reserve when you see it. Thank you, Thank so you much. very much. <laughs>